Welcome to Clinical Minute. Alex is a 25-year-old Latina transgender woman on your schedule for follow-up today. She is an established patient you have seen for three previous visits in the last year related to initiation and ongoing care for her gender-affirming hormone therapy. You know from previous visits with Alex that she prefers the pronouns she and her, works part-time in retail, has health insurance, does not use tobacco, reports daily alcohol use, and has a history of cocaine use, but does not use currently. According to previous discussions, her last cocaine use was more than five years ago. She reports no use of injection drugs. Based on the thorough sexual health history you discussed during your first visit, you know that Alex has had more than five partners in her life, has had both male and female partners, has had only male partners in the last five years, engages in receptive anal intercourse, uses condoms sometimes, and is not currently in a monogamous relationship. She has no medical conditions, and her medications include estradiol, 2 mg, twice a day, and an androgen blocker, finasteride, 1 mg daily. Your clinic's protocol for hormone management therapy for transgender patients is based on recommendations from Fenway Health's 2015 The Medical Care of Transgender Persons and the Center for Excellence for Transgender Health's 2016 Guidelines for the Primary and Gender-Affirming Care of Transgender and Gender Non-Binary People. Today is Alex's three-month follow-up visit. Before entering the room, you consider information you have recently learned about the disproportionately high prevalence of HIV infection among transgender women. Both the National Center for Transgender Equality's 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, estimate that between 1 in 5 and 1 in 4 transgender women are HIV positive. This is a 34-fold higher prevalence compared to cisgender reproductive age adults, meaning people whose gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth. The total percentage of HIV infection among transgender women is estimated to be a staggering 22%. African-American or black transgender women suffer disproportionately high rates of HIV infection, comprising a little more than 50% of the new HIV infections among transgender women. Latino women are the next most impacted group, accounting for almost 30% of HIV infections among U.S. transgender women. This high prevalence within the population is the reason transgender women have been identified as a key population for HIV prevention efforts. Both CDC and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines recommend routine HIV screening at least once in a lifetime for all people, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. Based on information Alex has shared over the course of her last several visits, she meets CDC guidelines for more frequent screening. In particular, she reported multiple partners, inconsistent use of condoms, receptive anal intercourse, and previous drug use. Additional guidance about HIV screening for transgender persons can be found in the Guidelines for the Primary and Gender-Affirming Care of Transgender and Gender Non-Binary People, available at transhealth.ucsf.edu slash guidelines. You are also thinking about how PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, may be a useful prevention option for Alex. At this time, the only FDA-approved PrEP formulation contains 300 mg TDF with 200 mg FTC, sold in the United States as Truvada. 2014 CDC guidelines recommend providing PrEP for healthy adults at risk of acquiring HIV infection. These guidelines explicitly address men who have sex with men, sexually active, heterosexual, cisgender men and women, and people who inject drugs, but do not address PrEP specifically for transgender people. However, there have been several studies published that have examined use of PrEP by transgender women. These studies concluded that 
As with cisgender women, PrEP is effective when taken on a daily basis as recommended. Although data are limited, there do not appear to be significant differences in PrEP side effects based on gender. A small percent of PrEP users, approximately 10%, experience initial symptoms such as headache, nausea, or dizziness. Because these symptoms usually resolve after the first month of treatment, they are sometimes referred to as startup syndrome. It is important for people, including transgender women, to discuss monitoring for signs and symptoms of new HIV infection since initial viral symptoms are vague and can mimic some of the side effects. There are helpful provider checklists and patient education resources, including a patient agreement form, available from both CDC and the Truvada REMS website. These forms can help remind providers of the requisite labs and recommended follow-up appointment schedule. The patient agreement forms can be used to facilitate patient-provider communication about side effects, labs, the follow-up schedule, and other critical counseling information. You also have in mind that Alex might meet criteria for NPEP, which stands for Non-Occupational Post-Exposure Prophylaxis, either today or at some time in the future. NPEP can be used within 72 hours of having sexual contact with a known HIV-positive person, assuming that there was exposure of vaginal, rectal, oral, ocular, or other mucous membrane tissue or non-intact skin to blood, semen, vaginal, or rectal secretions, or any other body fluid visibly contaminated with blood. Sexual contact with a person whose HIV status is unknown also meets the criteria for an NPEP evaluation and possible treatment. You know that receptive, condomless, anal intercourse is the highest risk behavior for HIV infection and that Alex has shared this is a practice she engages in. Although the 2016 CDC NPEP guidelines make several treatment recommendations based on criteria such as renal function and age, the general recommendation for an adult with normal renal function would be a once-daily dose of Truvada, along with Roltegravir 400 mg twice daily, or Dolutegravir 50 mg once daily for four weeks after exposure. CDC also provides an alternative regimen in case the preferred regimen is not available or the patient has specific contraindications to one of the preferred medications. CDC's NPEP guidelines do not make specific NPEP recommendations for transgender individuals. Alex agreed to screening for HIV and other STIs at her initial visit, and all of her results came back negative. However, you have not re-screened her or asked her about her sexual activity since then. Even if Alex does not indicate risk for NPEP at today's visit, you want her to know of its availability and how to access it, especially since access varies across locations. At your office, you routinely use the PLICIT model to address sexual health concerns with patients. The PLICIT model stands for Permission, Limited Information, Specific Suggestions, and Intensive Therapy. This method allows you to remain patient-centered and to assess the information they are ready and willing to receive. On your way in to see Alex, you get some resources in case she is interested in learning about PrEP. You pick three that you think would be most appropriate for her. They are Project Informs Transcending Barriers for Safer Pleasure, which is available from thewellproject.org, materials developed specifically for transgender women from hiveonline.org slash prep for trans women, and Safer Sex for Trans Bodies, available at whitmanwalker.org. After entering the room and greeting Alex, you take a few minutes to discuss how things are going with her hormones. After a brief discussion in which she tells you she's very happy with how the hormones are affecting her body, you decide that this would be a good time to talk with Alex about her HIV risks and prevention options. Applying the PLICIT model, you start by asking permission to discuss HIV risks. Alex looks worried, 
and says that she was very anxious when you suggested getting an HIV test at her first visit, but that she was very relieved when the results were negative. She goes on to say that some of her friends have said that you can't take HIV medication and hormones at the same time. Her voice catches and tears well in her eyes as she says that she's afraid to keep testing because she can't go off her hormones after working so hard to start this process of being who she really is. You recognize the opportunity to address Alex's concerns with specific suggestions and quickly reassure her that this is a common concern for transgender women and that if she did test positive for HIV at any point, she would still be able to take her hormones. You go on to tell her that you would only test her if she agrees to be tested, and what you really wanted to talk about today is her different options for preventing HIV infection. You ask Alex what she knows about ways to prevent HIV. She says that she knows she should never share needles for her hormones or other drugs, and that she should use a condom when she has sex. You provide positive reinforcement and reassure Alex that she is exactly right. You then ask her if she knows about newer medications that can be prescribed to prevent HIV. She says she thinks she saw a commercial about a new medication, but she thought it was only for gay men. You ask her if she would be interested in hearing more information. She nods yes, and you ask her if it would be okay to go over questions you asked about sexual behavior at her first visit. Asking additional questions at this point will better prepare you to provide intensive therapy, if indicated, in the form of additional counseling and prescribing of PrEP. Alex agrees to answer questions, saying that you made her feel comfortable when you talked the first time. You tell Alex that this time you're just going to ask her about the last three months instead of her whole lifetime. Using the four P's model, you review questions you discussed with Alex at her first visit asking about her partners, practices, STI prevention methods, parenting. You skip the questions you usually ask about parenting because you remember that Alex told you definitively that she does not want to have children herself. Alex shares with you that she has not really wanted to have sex since starting on hormones. She was seeing a few different people before she started her hormones, but now she's just seeing this one guy who's been really nice. She says that she hasn't used any drugs for more than five years and has never used injection drugs. You ask her if she has had insertive or receptive anal or frontal intercourse since your last visit. You use the term frontal because you know that some transgender people may prefer not to focus on genitals that don't match their gender identity. Alex says that she's only had receptive anal intercourse with her current partner. She also shares they did discuss condoms. They've used condoms most of the time, but didn't use them a couple of times when they first got together about a month ago. She knows it is important to use condoms, but she also does not want to insist on it since she knows it feels better for him without, and she feels so lucky that she's with such a nice guy who supports her transition and she doesn't want to mess things up. You also ask whether she knows if her current partner is aware of his HIV status or whether they've talked about it. She says she has thought about asking him, but again worries he might get turned off if she asked. You reassure Alex that her concerns are normal, and you ask her what she feels ready to do today to prevent HIV. She responds that she is definitely interested in hearing more about the medicine you mentioned you agree that this seems a good place to start. Based on information she shared with you, there does not seem to be an indication for NPEP. However, you make sure to tell her that there is a medication that people can take after possible exposure to HIV through sex, but that it needs to be taken within three days or 72 hours after sex. You move on to discussing PrEP. You go over with Alex that the medication involves taking a single pill once a day, every day, for as long as she is at risk for potential exposure to HIV. You also go over the side effects and the importance of routine labs and follow-up appointments. You also tell Alex that you would need to do some additional tests if she's interested in starting on PrEP, 
you explain that you know from tests done at her initial visit that she is immune to hepatitis B with no evidence of infection, which means she doesn't need to retake this test. Also, the complete metabolic panels you did at her first visit and her one-month follow-up indicate that her kidneys are functioning well, so there's no need to repeat that today. In order to start PrEP, you would definitely need to confirm her HIV negative status. If she is willing to do a repeat HIV test, you could prescribe PrEP for her to start right away. Because she has had sex without a condom since her last visit, you also suggest taking gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia tests today. Finally, you remind Alex that even with PrEP, condoms should continue to be used as protection against HIV infection. Alex agrees to take a rapid HIV test today. While you're waiting for results, you take the opportunity to ask Alex if she'd be willing to talk with her partner about his HIV status. She says she will, even though it makes her nervous. You also encourage her to review the brochures you provided while you check on her test. Alex's HIV test result is negative. You share the news with her, and she breathes a sigh of relief. She also says that she would like a prescription for PrEP today. You provide positive reinforcement for Alex's decisions, provide her a PrEP prescription, and schedule an appointment for her in one month. The one-month follow-up appointment provides a good opportunity to review adherence, any side effects, and other information, such as what to do in case of a missed dose. It will also provide an opportunity to reconfirm her HIV status. You remind her that there are free condoms available in your waiting room and that she may take as many as she needs. Before concluding today's visit, you remind Alex to contact your office if she encounters any difficulty accessing the medication or thinks of additional questions.